Uh, we got David Waters from Gators Breakdown here to talk one of the three that will be played, Florida and Arkansas. David, how you doing tonight? I'm good, Mark, man. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. So um, Gators coming off the huge win against uh, Georgia. I'm sure you've had a whole lot of fun talking that one up. Uh, what is the general mood besides the typical elation over beating Georgia from the Florida fan base uh, in, in pretty resounding fashion, getting down 14 to nothing and then roaring back for a 16-point win? Yeah, roaring back, getting that big victory. Uh, you got control of the East now, so basically the message right now, Mark, is don't let up. Uh, you can't get uh, can't get too high uh, after beating Georgia last week. You still got uh, you know half your season left. Five games now, more than likely six with the SEC championship game uh, there. So you know, look, you, it won't be hard to get up for Arkansas. It shouldn't be. Um, you you got that big victory over Georgia, and look, you're going to get your former quarterback. <laughs> I mean, so at least everybody on this Florida team right now knows Felipe Franks. They know him very well. He was a quarterback for this team. So uh, you know for since 2017 so it's uh you know very interesting that uh, when the sec announced a new 10 game schedule i wondered in the back of my mind would this game be scheduled with arkansas because of the felipe franks thing and don't get me wrong that's not why it was scheduled but it was, it was, i was going to find it very interesting if they did schedule it because of the felipe frank storyline there so yeah mark it mainly is you know you got the big, big victory over georgia you just can't get too happy you got to move on and i don't think it'll be that hard to move on given that you're facing your former quarterback well it won't be a packed house of course at the swamp but still we'll get a little taste of whether there's been a lot of love lost between gator fans and felipe franks of course he had a love-hate relationship with the uh, fan base uh, down there uh, during his time as a Gators quarterback. Um, you know, you certainly saw a uh, development uh, with him under Dan Mullen that really mm -hmm. underlines what Dan Mullen's all about and his capabilities. Uh, we could go through uh, from his time as a coordinator on to Mississippi State on through, and we see Felipe Franks, and the number I'm going to throw at you is one that you know well, nine TDs and eight picks the year before Dan Mullen, and then 24 to six TD to pick ratio under Dan Mullen. So what did you see in Felipe Franks that uh, I would think that he's carrying through in his stint with Arkansas? Yeah, it is a lot of the same things. Um, has the big arm, but not asked to throw down the field a whole lot because he's not that accurate. He could throw it down there. Don't get me wrong. He can throw it 75, 80 yards, <laughs> no, no problem. But, you know, hitting somebody in that 75, 80 yards has is, is been the issue. So uh, it's still, you know, a, a safe version of football. Arkansas likes to still run the ball, much like you go back two years ago with Florida. It was, a, you know, the Jordan Scarlett, the Michael Piran show. And then as the season went on, Felipe Franks was – you know, asked to run the ball a bit more as well. Very instrumental in that comeback versus South Carolina that year after you were coming off of losses to Georgia and Missouri. And, you know, Felipe Frank scored the touchdown that game, such as the crowd, and some of the crowd was not too happy with that. Some understood uh, why he did what he did uh, at, at that point of his career. So, yeah, went on to win, you know, 10 games and, and – Led Florida to a victory over Michigan uh, in the Peach Bowl that year. Mark, uh, the big thing is the coaching staff loved him and his teammates loved him, and that's really all that mattered. I mean, and um, he played. You know, it, it, if he didn't have a good game, it wasn't because of you know of his own fault of not trying. He he gave all he had uh, as a Gator. Um, you know, mo most of the fan base hated to see him go, but understood why. Hated to see him go. Kind of the way it played out. You wish, you know, it would have worked out better for him, but you understood that Kyle Trask was playing better. Kyle Trask was going to be the quarterback. There was no fault in Felipe Franks leaving uh, the, the University of Florida. So, um, but yeah, he's he's not asked to do a whole lot. Uh, I think he's a great leader. I think that's why Sam Pittman kind of, I, I won't say fell into luck of getting Felipe Franks, but I think it was a, it was a good idea to, to get a quarterback with so much SEC experience and one that I think a, that a team gravitates towards. And that's kind of the way Felipe Franks is. So I think his teammates play hard for him. And I think that I think in one way of his play elevates everybody around him too. But I think it's more because he's such a gravitational type of personality on a team that I think everybody wants to go play for him. And I expect to see that Saturday as well. And it's been fun watching uh, Arkansas play. It's been fun watching their story unfold. They're not going to be competing for any championships or anything like that. But considering where they've been for the last two years, not even getting beat around by the SEC, 
But when you're in the SEC, and typically Vandy's the only one that delivers this, you can't step out of conference play and beat the group of five teams. And they had lost to the North Texases and Western Kentuckys and Colorado States and on down the line uh, over the last several years. And they're, they're, they're a fun team to watch. They're letting it all hang out. They're having fun. So they're certainly not going to let down. They're coming off a nice win against Tennessee, down two scores in the first half. But going to the Swamp, the Gators coming back off their biggest win in years. Uh, the the proverbial letdown scenario. Yeah, it, it, it is in the back of your mind, but I think it's a good thing that they are playing Felipe Franks because I, I do think it's a reason to get up uh, for, for this game and, and not kind of let it just go by the wayside uh, here. You know, kind of just even looking at Arkansas and and, and kind of what they're doing. You mentioned a game versus Tennessee last week, down 13 nothing, and, and they come back there. Um, it'd be interesting to see how they play uh, th- this Gator offense with that Barry Odom led defense, and he's going to be the interim coach. I mean, Sam Pittman's not going to be head coach in this game because he tested. I mean, that was the first big COVID story of the SEC week was Sunday. We get word Sam Pittman had tested positive, the Arkansas head coach, uh, for uh, COVID, and then a day later it's confirmed again and that he would not be the coach. So, defensive coordinator. And former Missouri head coach Barry Odom is going to step in. So does that affect the Missouri or the uh, Arkansas defense uh, versus uh, uh, Florida on Saturday? You know, this Florida offense is dealing right now. Kyle Trask is playing like one of the best quarterbacks in the country right now. Uh, lit up a, a really good Georgia defense, and Arkansas leads the country right now in twelve interceptions uh, for us. So they're going to play a lot of zone and ask Kyle Trask to you know pick them apart if he can, and he's done he's done that. I mean, Pretty much, Mark, whatever defense you want to play versus Kyle Trask, he has proven that if man, zone, mix, blitz, whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. He's proven that he can go beat it. But, you know, one reason Arkansas has those 12 interceptions, a lot of college football quarterbacks just can't sit there. They want to go for the big play a lot. They play a lot of zone. They don't they don't give up big plays. They just let the offenses dink and dunk, dink and dunk, and dink and dunk around the field, and somebody gets impatient, and they throw an interception. Well, Kyle Trask hasn't done that. He 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 plays within that. He he has no issue dinking and dunking and then letting a the wide receiver break a tackle and then go for 50 yards or, or if it plays out that way. So uh, I will be interested to see if they, with, with 12 interceptions so far this season, if they can for, force Kyle Trask uh, in, into one or two of those and, and make a closer game of it, but – they also have – Arkansas has one of the worst run defenses in the country, one of the worst run defenses in the SEC. This might be the game we see the Florida run game kind of solidify itself. So played pretty good versus Georgia last week. When they needed a run, they got the run. And that was a, a big key for me uh, last week in that preview. preview and in that game with what Georgia was missing, well, now they're playing a run defense that's not so great. So can you take a couple of young offensive linemen that got some playing time versus Georgia last week, insert them into this game, and then go run the ball versus uh, one of the uh, SEC's worst run defenses. So the main narrative that we talked up last week leading into the Georgia game was, uh, do the Bulldogs still have a significant or decided talent gap? I won't call it significant even one or two years ago, but decided talent gap. And will they push Florida around as they have bullied them along uh, both sides of the football? Or will Florida's ability to make plays, their skill on offense, the trigger man being as good as he is, and Kyle Trask take over and lead to a victory? So we, we got our our questions answered, whether Florida's overtaken them in terms of talent or or bulk or strength. We don't know that, but they're good enough. They're good enough, and they're, they've overtaken them in regards to just running an offense with the guy that they've got. Um, calling the plays and then also executing the plays on the field. So to you, what was the most impressive part of Florida's win? Probably the big plays. Um, There's been a lot of big plays for this Gator offense, but it was identifying one particular mismatch that you had and you just abused it until, you know, the game was pretty much out of hand. And that was the wheel route. I mean, it's not a staple of Dan Mullen's offense. You know, this was not a play. This is not a play we see every week. This is not a play we every we even see once every now and then. But there was something Dan Mullen and Kyle Trask and, and that offensive staff and every everybody on the offense identified, whether it be in those couple weeks they were hit by COVID or something, and you know, whatever they had seen from this Georgia defense at some point in the season, maybe even going back to the Alabama game, that they 
could take advantage of. And it was Florida's running backs versus the Georgia linebackers, and they could not stop it. So probably one of the better coach and better scheme games I've seen from Dan Mullen in his time at Florida. It was – and it didn't matter who the running back was, Mark, whether it be Damian Pierce, whether it be Naquan Wright, whether it be Malik Davis, all three running backs had big days pass catching the ball out of the backfield. And it was it was it was it was something to behold because it was just over and over and over again. A lot of big plays from it. Uh, Malik Davis with a fifty yard catch, you know, or Nick Allen Wright with a fifty yard catch. Malik Davis with some nice catches uh, along the sideline. And then to do it again, Mark Kadarius Tony was held in check. Kyle Pitts went out midway through the second quarter when the game was tied twenty one twenty one, and you still went up put up points after that. Now I know the second half kind of Florida got conservative and a multitude of ways, play calling, mentally, whatever you want to call it. But it was 21-21 when Kyle Pitts went out, and Florida just went on a barrage in the second quarter. So you even did it without your two best offensive weapons, for the most part, going crazy. So that was probably the big takeaway was the way the offense scored, with the wheel route, identifying something there, and doing it without your big playmakers out there. And so Kyle Pitts, based on the concussion protocol, I believe I heard Dan Mullen say that he's doubtful. Uh, questionable. Questionable. I then doubt he plays, though. Pardon me? I doubt he plays, though. Then you got uh, Jeremiah Moon also yep. in that category. And, uh, and the guard offensive here. lineman Stuart Reese. Stuart Reese. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so those are the three injuries. Fairly significant. Um, certainly Kyle Pitts, extremely significant. Uh, for Florida taking on Arkansas as a 16-point uh, favorite against the Hogs. Um, <laughs> any particular particular perspective on what's going on uh, throughout the league with uh, only three games going to be played out of seven. Uh, some good Halloween parties, I guess, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> is that where it's coming from? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. It is kind of weird. Of course, you know, Florida had the uh, hit and look, it, it seems numbers wise, these teams weren't hit as hard as Florida was, but through all the contact tracing, it's kind of more playing it safe more so than the other way around, just kind of a team get hit really, really hard. I think you're, uh, I think that's kind of w- w- what I've heard is not, not necessarily like the over, you know, what mid twenties to low thirties player Florida got hit with it's, Hey, it's five or six players, but through contact tracing, we have to hold these other players out as well. So yeah, Mark, it's, uh, I mean, it, we, we knew it was coming at some point. Uh, it, it was inevitable uh, that, that it was going to happen. Uh, and as I said, the, the timing of it, maybe maybe it was the Halloween parties and uh, and all that kind of stuff that you know went on at a college campus. It kind of I know that was the LSU reasoning for from what I heard. So it kind of just makes sense to maybe make that assumption. I, I will say I'm assuming here that to make the assumption that probably happened for the other schools uh, as well. But uh yeah, I mean, it, it stinks. Uh, I think all the SEC games are at night now. They're not even shifting the games around um, there. So you know, all the all the three SEC games that are taking place are going to be happening at the same time. So you know, we'll, we'll see what comes of it. Uh, and like I said, it started with Sam Pittman, Arkansas's coach, and it didn't go any further with him for that for that squad. It stayed there with him. I, I mean, that's kind of weird to me. I don't know how the head coach gets it is confirmed twice and nobody else is, is affected. That's kind of weird, but we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll take it. So Florida and Arkansas can play this weekend, but uh, kind, of, kind of odd there with everybody else getting hit pretty hard. And there's a head coach at another school and it's just kind of limited to that one person. So uh, it stinks. We won't have SEC football this week. I know you, you're an Ohio state guy and that game was in Maryland, the way they're playing right now too, would have been a, a nice matchup to see and to see if they could kind of continue their hot streak versus uh, Ohio state and Justin Fields uh, there. So a, a lot of good football. Mark, I, I did see the joke since, so, uh, since Alabama and Ohio state's game got canceled. Can they, can we just play Alabama and Ohio state sometime Saturday? <laughs> Ooh, wow. Wouldn't people want to see that? Exactly. Ooh. Come on, let's just go with it. Yeah, we could have matched up a lot of good matchups uh, throughout <laughs> yeah. the week, I'm sure, but that would be the showstopper, no doubt yeah. about that. Uh, maybe we'll see it a little bit later. And Mark, one, one more thing before I go here. Yeah. Like, and what happens with the SEC scheduling now? I mean, Florida and LSU were predicted or, or supposed to play December 12th. That was their tentative date there. I, doesn't it make more sense for Alabama and LSU to play that day since it's a division game instead of Florida and LSU? Uh, I mean, like, I'm not trying to 
you know, get Florida a break here before the SEC championship game. I mean, give them somebody else that day. I don't, I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, you can make them play that day. It's just, it makes more sense if, if it's a division game and or, or a cross division game to play the division game, if you're if you're trying to make up uh, one of those games, I know the SEC has pretty much said they're going to games that are not the SEC championship game and game, teams that can play will also play probably on December nineteenth as well. Uh, but you would think games that have to determine who's going to a a, a division game who's, that goes a lot further in determining who's going to play for a league championship would need to be played before the league championship. So it makes more sense to me that Alabama and LSU is, is figured out to, to play somewhere along the way before the SEC championship. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. We'll have to dive into that a little bit further as we go along. We will remind SEC fans, be thankful that you stepped on the field when you did. Of course, yeah. the ACC and the Big 12, it was a week or two prior. I think it was two weeks prior but still, September 26th made sense in the Big Ten. The league that was going to get on the field the first to provide that scheduling flexibility, they are boxed into a corner in the Pac-12 even more so uh, as they try to play a schedule. So at least there's some flexibility. And I find it interesting that you bring up uh, that the SEC can uh, go ahead and do a full slate of games or whatever games would need to be made up on championship weekend, much like with the Pac-12 and the Big Ten are actually scheduling just to fit in another week of football. Yeah. And I find that pretty interesting uh, on the day that the conference championship game is going to be played. Just another weird, quirky uh, scheduling snafu that we're going to have to deal with, but will be kind of fun at the same time. Yeah, it'd be, right. fun, to see, it'd be fun to see how serious those teams take it. I mean, the season's basically over with at that point. <laughs> so, uh, you know, who, who knows how serious those teams will, will, will take it by then. Maybe a, a glorified spring game and you know, a lot of young guys play it. Absolutely. David Waters, Gators Breakdown. So go to your favorite uh, audio platform. Look up Gators Breakdown. Keep it locked in here on YouTube as well. You can find them here. Again, it's Gators Breakdown. David, we always appreciate it. Thanks, Mark.